Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's MotorAge Powertrain Pro webinar entitled Reading a Wiring Schematic. I'm Pete Meyer, MotorAge Technical Editor, and tonight's webinar is being brought to you by the folks at TransStar and TransTech. You know, reading and understanding a wiring diagram is one of the three fundamental skills that every technician needs in order to be successful in finding and fixing electrical faults. Tonight, Powertrain Pro Publisher and President of ATSG, Wayne Colonna, will share several tips and techniques to help you improve your schematic reading skills. And with that, let's turn it over to Wayne. Okay, well, thank you, Peter. And I, I would like to welcome and thank all of you who have joined us. And I would, would also like to thank TransStar and TransTech, our sponsors, for this evening's presentation. Well. Tonight's subject is designed to help those who may have some apprehension in reading and using wiring diagrams in the diagnostic approach when electrical malfunctions are present. And from speaking with some guys on the tech lines, in many ways there is a similar hesitation in reading oil schematics because it's more than just looking at the hydraulics. It's understanding what you're looking at and then being able to decide what needs to be tested or inspected. And the same goes with reading wiring schematics. We're not talking about just reading lines on a page. We're talking about being able to extract what we see on the page to successfully locate, isolate, and test a circuit. And reading schematics involves an understanding of electricity, understanding the operation of an electrical device, and knowing how to use test equipment to check both the wiring and the electrical components. So it can be daunting, especially for those who do not have formal training in this area. Now to approach such a large subject in a short amount of time that we have, there is a method I have used over the years that has been helpful to others in classes I've done, and I have a condensed version of this method which I'll be sharing with all of you this evening in hopes that it will be as helpful to you as it has with others. But before we get into it, let me cover a few basic items. The two most common sources for obtaining wiring diagrams are Mitchell and all data. And there are a couple of points that I would like to make about this. Those who use Mitchell as their source for wiring diagrams, receive Mitchell's method of standardized OE wiring. They have all the same look and the symbol usages are the same, while those who use all data receive OE wiring. With OE diagrams, there is an inconsistency of how wiring diagrams are presented. Ford, for example, is totally different than Volkswagen. And for this reason, it will require reviewing each and every manufacturer's symbol descriptions to understand what it is that you're looking at, as well as the instructions they provide on reading their wiring schematics. But you do this once, and you pretty much have that manufacturer down. Now, obviously, it's not possible for us to go through each and every one of them this evening. That would, that would take us hours to do. But there are advantages and disadvantages between Mitchell and, and all data. And again, the advantage with Mitchell is the uniformity in their wiring presentations. You don't have to work your way through too many differences. On the other hand, OE schematics may offer more information that can be enormously helpful, which you will not find with Mitchell. Take Mitsubishi, for example. They provide connector names and views within their schematics, as well as their wiring colors, uh, the, the coding for their wiring colors, and legends describing the electrical components being represented within the diagrams itself. And as mentioned before, in terms of disadvantages with OE diagrams, you will also have to work your way through their way of doing things. Toyota, for example offers up very nice color schematics with thick lines for the wires for easy reading, but it can be very confusing when it comes to connector identification because when you look within the box that represents the ECM, for example, they'll assign the E4 connector 
with the letter A, the E5 with the letter B, E7 with, a, with the C, and E8 with a D. Now, using E5 with the letter B as an example, now look at where the wire enters the ECM connector. It has a B in a circle with an 11 to the left. This means that the high side of the SLU solenoid is in the E5 connector, terminal 11. Now you have to go and find a connector view to determine which one is the E5 connector plugging into the ECM. The, uh, the one that I hear that, that is most disliked is Volkswagen's wiring. They present their wiring in a horizontal block form called tracks. The numbers across the bottom represent imaginary track grids. This is why you would see one block perhaps called 1 through 14, indicating that there are 14 imaginary grid lines. But they're there simply to represent a block of wiring assisting you in knowing where you are in this lengthy horizontal wiring presentation. The arrows let you click to the next block or back to the previous block. And, and each block is accompanied with a legend to identify the components being represented. Power circuits usually come in from the top with grounds going to the bottom of the page. Again, once you learn this, reading these schematics become quite informative. So with having this basic intro, let's get started. Whether you are using Mitchell or all data, the one common aspect to reading any and all wiring diagrams begins with knowing how to relate the wiring to the actual components involved. Looking at this example of an OE schematic for a Ford Explorer, the information provided in the wiring schematic is being pointed out to the actual connectors and components on the vehicle. This is an important step in reading schematics. Knowing how to interpret the schematic to the actual vehicle is imperative when we talk about reading wiring schematics. In the schematic, connector ID is given. Terminal numbers provided in the schematic are usually embossed into the connectors themselves. Information on wire colors are provided, which fuse handles power to the solenoid. Take all of this in including identifying which terminals are being used in the connectors and which ones are empty, a variety of different tests can be determined depending on the electrical problem that needs to be addressed. Now, having used this block diagram as an example of interpreting the schematic to the actual vehicle, what we're going to do now is take a look at three components. We're going to be looking at speed sensors, range sensors, switches, and solenoids. What it is we'll be looking at first and foremost are the various ways electrical schematics represents these components. And we will then look at the various ways they operate so basic testing can be determined and performed. Starting now with speed sensors, we have several different styles to deal with. The old style read switch, which is important to show for reasons you'll see shortly. And then there are AC pulse generators that produce alternating current. Uh, they could be either two wire or three wire configurations. And then we have Hall effect sensors, which also can be two, two wire and three wire configurations. This is a GM Azuzu wiring schematic showing both a reed switch design on the left side and an AC pulse generator on the right. The reed switch will be our first focus. This particular design has a typical speedometer drive and driven gear with a cable that runs up into the instrument cluster. Inside the speedometer odometer assembly, there is a five volt wire from the computer that is attached to a switch. The speedometer cable from the transmission spins a magnetic wheel which closes contacts in the switch, completing the circuit to ground. This is the typical way this style speed sensor is presented in a wiring diagram. This particular setup has four magnets on the rotating shaft which means the five volt wire will be post the ground 
pulse to ground four times per one complete rota revolution or rotation of the shaft. The speed is then calculated by the computer based on this input. This type of speed sensor is best checked with a scope where that zero to five volt DC pulse signal can be visualized to be sure that it is fully pulled to ground and fully released and that the pulse increases with speed. This test can be performed anywhere on the wire between the computer and the instrument cluster, preferably as close to the computer as possible. But in this first example, the idea is to quickly identify the way this component is represented in a wiring diagram and then know how to test its operation. Since this style sensor is rarely used these days, why even cover it at all? Well, there's a short history about this that could bring us up to today and why it's important to know this. You may remember the days when GM used a digital ratio adapter controller called the DRAC or otherwise known as a speed buffer. Well, this buffer was located in various locations and it would receive the AC pulse generator signal from the output shaft speed sensor, which is an alternating current, and, and this DRAC, this buffer, would convert it to a digital signal by pulsing a 5-volt wire to ground that was coming from the computer, and this is exactly what the read switch did. Now, Ford used a method called the Programmable Speedometer Odometer Module, a PSOM for short, which took the RAB sensor signal and it ran it up into the instrument cluster where this module was located. It would then provide a conditioned signal to the PCM. Now having said that, today we have several manufacturers that receive an AC pulse generator signal into the instrument cluster and the instrument cluster then acts as a speed buffer which then pulses a 5-volt wire from the computer to ground like this Nissan wiring schematic shows. This schematic really doesn't tell you this, but when you see a double or a triple vehicle speed signal going directly into the instrument cluster and then a separate wire as a speed signal at the computer, you should immediately recognize that this single wire is a voltage wire being grounded by the instrument cluster acting as the speed buffer. Now this is usually a 5 volt wire. Now looking at the wiring diagram, notice that the wire next to the 0505 numbers is going to both the ECM and the TCM. The wire thickness going to the ECM is thicker than the one going to the TCM. The thicker wire tells you that the ECM is the computer supplying the 5 volts to be pulsed by the instrument cluster. This schematic really is a great example of another benefit that can occur when being able to read wiring diagrams and understanding how the system operates and then being able to interpret it and how it relates to the vehicle because let's just say that you have a scan tool that shows a vehicle speed signal on the ECM side, but not on the TCM side. Looking at the schematic, what does that tell you? Well, it should tell you that everything is working from the VSS all the way into the instrument cluster, and the 5-volt wire is being supplied by the ECM is getting pulsed to ground, which is why you're actually seeing a signal in the scan tool on the ECM side. But it means that the signal is being lost somewhere from the splice to the TCM. And that's why on the TCM side you don't see the signal. So just by looking at this wiring I a diagram, you have an idea where the problem lies and you haven't even touched a scope or a digital graphing multimeter. Now we began looking at the read switch and saw how it is designed to pulse a signal wire to ground. This system used in a GM Isuzu vehicle was eliminated and converted it to a Hall sensor, a Hall effect sensor. Here is the schematic for it. Now here you can see that the Hall effect sensor supplied a signal into the instrument cluster, 
where the cluster then pulses a 5-volt wire to ground. And, and here is another example of a 0 to 5-volt pulse. Many 41TE transmissions in Dodge and Chrysler vehicles is a direct input into the TCM. They have the AC speed signal as a direct input into the TCM. You may be familiar with doing a pinion factor, and that's so that the computer could know what gear ratio the transmission is. But once that pinion factor was done, by receiving this AC signal, this alternating current signal, the TCM would act as a buffer, and it would take this 5-volt wire coming from the PCM. And the PCM, by taking that 5-volt wire and pulsing it to ground, the PCM would then be able to recognize what that speed signal was, and then that signal would be broadcasted over the network to all the other modules. The idea is to be able to quickly identify this 0 to 5-volt pulse system by looking at wiring diagrams and then knowing the best place to check the signal. With this Dodge Chrysler vehicle, this could easily be done by Terminal 58 at the TCM and better yet, at 66, Terminal 66 at the PCM. But now let's move on to um, the AC pulse generators that produce an alternating current signal. This is one of the ways that you will see an AC pulse generator speed sensor signal being represented in a wiring diagram. A mechanical wheel may be part of the diagram to symbolize the device used to alter the magnetic field that emanates from the sensor itself, which then generates an alternating current signal to the computer or the instrument cluster. Now the lines, uh, the crossing of the lines that you see in the external harness represents the two represents like two wires being twisted. Now, this is an inexpensive yet effective method used to prevent RF interference, but it's seeing these crossing of the lines that you want to recognize as an indication of a form of protection against noise, which is typically indicative of an AC pulse generator, an alternating current type speed sensor. However, I have to say that in some instances, Hall effect sensors may also have twisted wires. So this is not 100%, but we'll get to that later. Now, another way that twisted wire is represented in a wiring schematic is with looped lines around the wires, as the red arrow is pointing out on the external speed sensor in this schematic from GM. I also included another common way that you will see this represented by the red line on the internal speed sensor wires. Now here is a different GM schematic showing twisted wiring being represented by this type of a line across the wires. Now getting back to this schematic, how do we know that this loop line around the wires indicates twisted wiring. Notice the explanation point in a triangular icon alongside the loop line symbol. This is an example with OE wiring diagrams where you need to go a step further to know what the icon next to the loop line means. It's obvious it has something to do with it. So, you have to locate it, and, and once you locate that glossary and you find that explanation point in that triangular icon, it's quite informative. Not only do they tell you it's twisted wires acting as a shield, but it that, that it has a minimum twist of nine turns for every 12 inches. Now here is another way an AC pulse generator is represented in a wire diagram. One is a two-wire sensor and the other is a three-wire. The dotted line represents a shield that wraps around the two-wire speed sensors, the, 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 two, the two speed sensor wires, and with the two-wire the, two connector, the shield is mounted to an external ground. Like here's an example of, of a roll of audio cable that I use when I need to run new shielded speed sensor wiring. I get this from Radio Shack. And here you can see the ground wire that is wrapped around the two speed sensor wires. 
this wire is to be grounded at one end or the other somewhere in the vehicle and as well as regular factory um, two-wire speed sensors that have a shield. It needs to be grounded somewhere one end or the other uh, of, that, of that wiring. Now the three-wire setup has a shield around the two wires with the ground for the shield going to its own terminal at the computer. An example of this style sensor is with Volkswagen's O1M transmission, as you can see here. And this is how Volkswagen represents it in, in their wiring. Again, you can see the shield, the dotted line going around the two speed sensor wires, and then the shield, the ground, has its own terminal at the computer. Now, in this slide that I'm showing, I have all the different designs of AC speed sensors and how they are typically represented in wiring schematics that we have just finished looking at. The point that I would like to make here is that sometimes they are seen where there is no mechanical wheel or coil represented in the schematic as seen in this slide. You will see when we cover the whole effect sensors why this is important to point out. But just looking at these four different designs, by being familiar with these types of arrangements or these ways of how they're, they're represented in wiring, you can quickly pick out most of the time that these are AC voltage type speed sensors. Well, having looked at <coughs> schematics for various AC speed sensors, Regardless of design, they are all best checked using a scope. With the connectors unplugged, a resistance check of the sensors may help discover shorts or opens in the circuit. But if the wiring is good, checking the sensor signal is best done with a scope. Now the final speed sensor to cover is the Hall effect type. And again, these can be also two-wire or three-wire in design. Here is a schematic <clears throat> for a three-wire design of GM's input shaft speed sensor in a 4L60E transmission. It has a power wire, a ground wire, and a signal wire. In fact, the power is the same power to most all the solenoids inside the transmission as well. Now, in this schematic, you will notice there is no indication of any protection against RF interference like we saw with the AC pulse generator. This slide represents how both a two-wire Hall effect sensor may be represented in a schematic. The three-wire that you, in other words, this slide is showing both a two-wire and three-wire Hall effect sensors and how they might be represented in a wiring diagram. The three-wire is the top wiring with the two-wire just below it. But if you look inside the sensor, there is an internal circuit of the sensor which reveals some slight differences with the construction of the sensors. But these are various ways that this sensor may be presented, and, and it's totally different than when you look at an AC. Uh, voltage uh, sensor in a wiring. So there is a significant difference when you have the circuitry written in. Now, if you remember, we saw this schematic from, from GM Azuzu earlier. And this shows a similar circuitry inside the sensor, but the important point is, again, is to recognize that this is a Hall effect and not a pulse generator. Now, getting back to this slide, whether you have a three-wire or two-wire Hall effect sensor, they each have a power wire and a signal wire. Only the three-wire design has a hard ground to path. Now, some of these Hall effect sensors provide a digital signal of an approximate zero to five volt pulse, while others may provide an approximate one volt pulse typically from a half a volt to 1.5 volt. But notice once again the importance of a pulse signal. Similar to the read switch, similar to the speed buffers, ultimately the computer needs a digital signal wherever, 
or however it is produced to calculate a vehicle speed signal. Now here is an example of an OE wiring diagram showing two two wire hall effect sensors in a Volkswagen's 09G transmission. Again notice in this case there is no indication of any protection against RF interference, no twisted lines, no dotted lines around the wires, just four wires, one power, one signal wire for each of the two sensors. The OSS reads the parking gear while the ISS, the input chest speed sensor, reads the lugs on the K2 drum. There is a significant difference in the lug distances and the amount of lugs per one revolution between these two sensors. Now the best way to check these signals, once again, is with a scope like we've been seeing with all other speed sensors. Now with a dual channel, you can check both the power and the signal as done here. The yellow is the power supply to the ISS and the green is the power supply to the OSS and they need to stay steady and never drop out. The red is the ISS pulse signal and the blue is the OSS pulse, pulse signal. And these two should never drop out unless you come to a complete stop with your foot on the brake. The difference in the amount of pulses has to do with the amount of teeth and the distance between the teeth and as the speed increases, so should these pulses. Now a closer look at this particular design, and you can see that this is a one volt pulse type between about a half a volt to 1.5 volts. We've been seeing this uh, typically with all Eisen type systems, whereas all the other ones seem to be the zero to five volt pulse type. And here is just an example of a screen capture showing an intermittent dropout on the signal wire, um, as you can see here. Now, here is where there can be some confusion between a two-wire AC pulse generator and a two-wire Hall effect. If the wiring schematic represents the sensor showing its internal circuit like these two that you see, you could immediately distinguish it and know right away that these are Hall effect sensors, um, even if it has twisted wires. And, and here we're showing twisted wires on a Hall effect sense, on a Hall effect sensor. So I need to have a side note here because I'd like to explain that Hall effect sensors are not near as susceptible to RF interference as AC sensors since it offers a digital signal rather than an alternating current. So the purpose for using twisted wires in this case is prim prim primarily to provide a cleaner signal and particularly with high Hall effect frequency in other words Hall effect sensors with a higher frequency due to the sensor being excited by a larger number of teeth per revolution. So the, the twisted wires are acting more like a coaxial cable, if you will, to allow a cleaner signal to be delivered to the computer. But the confusion is, what if the two-wire Hall effect sensor is represented without showing the internal circuit? Now how do you know if this is an AC or Hall effect? Hall type sensor? Well, one way is to unplug it and check the wires from the computer. One of them should be supplying voltage to the sensor, which could range from 5 volts to system voltage. Now there is one drawback with this, and that is if you are dealing with a problem, this, this power supply to the sensor could either be, the wire could be cut or shorted to ground. So if you don't see any voltage there, it could, it could fool you into thinking it's an AC voltage sensor when really it's a Hall effect. But the idea is with Hall effects, one wire should have a voltage supply. Another way is to perform a diode test on the sensor itself. If it is a Hall effect sensor, there should be a notable difference in the readings. Okay. Next up are transmission range sensors or switches. And as you can see here, 
there are so many different styles, it's crazy. In fact, at the shop where I took this picture, I asked the tech what he would do if he needed the, the, the sensor that was on the bottom. And apparently he was not amused by my sense of humor. Anyway, I've selected enough of a variations, uh, I, I selected enough variations to work our way through that it will basically cover a broad range of the styles, switches, and sensors being used today. The first one up, is to look at this Dodge transmission range sensor. It has five blades in the sensor with one empty location. Here is the wiring schematic that represents this sensor. Now I enlarged the terminal numbers in red to be sure they are visible to you. And in looking at the schematic, it appears that terminal three is not being used. Terminal six is a 12 volt supply from the ECM to be used as a park neutral signal. Terminal one is a 12 volt supply via the integrated power module for the reverse lights out of terminal four. This now leaves two and five, terminals two and five, which we will look, take a closer look at in, in, in just a second. But based on terminal three appearing to be the blind terminal, we could logically number the terminals accordingly, one, two, blank, four, five, and six, especially if these numbers are not embossed into the connector to know for sure. Now getting back to the schematic, the wiring diagram seems to indicate that there is a five volt supply from the instrument cluster to terminal five at the TRS. This five volt wire will then sweep across a series of drop down resistors as the selector lever is moved from park all the way down to low, first number one. Now terminal two of the TRS goes to the instrument cluster and it appears that this circuit would serve as a ground. Now here are these resistors inside the sensor and as you can see, there are five shown in the schematic and five are inside the sensor. So now we have already determined that two wires have 12 volts going to them, terminals one and six, and one wire should have five volts, supposedly terminal five. Now, if we use our numbering system, the one, two, blank, four, five, six, we can check the vehicle harness to confirm these voltages by getting oriented to the locking tab. Now in this slide, I know you can't see this, but the wiring harness going to the transmission does not have a wire in the assumed terminal three location. But terminal one on the left side did have 12 volts to it. However, based on this assumed terminal numbering, it is discovered that terminal two in the middle is the actual five volt supply, not terminal five. And then of course, terminal six at the end to the right had near 12 volts. Now, if the wiring schematic was correct based on their numbering system, and then the voltage that we have seen actually coming down to the switch, the terminal numbers would have to run in this order. 65 blank 421. Now this does not look logical at all. And I bring this up not to be confusing, but to make a point that sometimes there are mistakes in wiring diagrams, just like this one, and we have to work our way through them. Now, nonetheless, now that we know which wire is the five volt wire, we can connect the harness and then back probe the wire. Now we can watch the voltage drop as we move the selector lever from park all the way down to the number one position as the wiring schematic indicated. And this is exactly what we saw. Park had the highest voltage as the circuit is connected to and running through all five resistors to get the ground. When the selector lever moved to reverse, we dropped off one of the resistors, which brought the five volt signal wire 
close to the ground. And this is what happens each time you move the selector lever down, down, down. Now, by, you, by looking at this, you get a better understanding of what this schematic is representing by the actual component in action with a meter, which is the method I like to use to help understand how to read wiring schematics. And by the way, what this schematic also shows is that since it is the instrument cluster that is receiving the transmission range signal, it is the module that is responsible to broadcast that signal over the network so the computer knows what gear the transmission is in. There is no hard range sensor signal going into the computer, which is a very important diagnostic detail. Now, some of you may have recognized another sensor similar to this Dodge transmission range sensor after seeing these resistors used to provide step-down voltage, and that is Ford's manual lever position sensor. This, too, has a 5-volt signal wire coming from the computer that runs through a series of resistors. With six drive positions, there needs to be six drop-down resistors inside the sensor, and it does, as you can see in this slide. The signal would be checked in the same way, back probe the 5-volt signal wire by the switch or by the computer and watch the voltage drop as each range is selected. Now, Ford has since moved on to what they call a digital transmission range sensor. This style is a bit more involved in reading the schematic and checking the signal, but it has proved to be a bit more of a reliable sensor. This is how the range sensor is represented in a wiring diagram. It's quite a bit to look at, but we will take it one piece at a time from left to right. Now, Terminal 9 is the power supply, which when connected to Terminal 11, will provide power to turn the reverse lights on. This can only occur when the selector lever is in reverse. No other way can the power from Terminal 9 be connected to Terminal 11 to power up the reverse lamps. Now here, Terminal 12 is a power supply from the ignition switch, which in park and neutral only, is it connected to the starting system through Terminal 10. Notice the way the lines are drawn inside showing park and neutral connected together with Terminal 10. It is Terminal 12 with the arrow that the wiring schematic suggests it moves as the selector lever moves. So when it is in reverse, OD, 2, and 1, there is no connection to park and neutral circuits out of Terminal 10. Now this next position is used in four-wheel drive configurations where Terminal 8 is a power supply which becomes grounded through Terminal 7 in neutral only. This allows four-wheel drive low to be selected only in the neutral position. Now here we are in the section used for the computer to know what gear range has been selected. Terminals 3, 4, 5, and 6 are supplied with power from the PCM. Now, three of these wires can be either 9.5 volts to system voltage, depending on the year, and one of these wires is a 5-volt supply. Now, each of these circuits is then grounded in various sequences through Terminal 2. Now, as you look at Terminal 6, for example, it is grounded when the selector lever is in P and in 1, park neutral in 1. Terminal 3, however, is quite unique when compared to all the others. When it is in park 2 and 1, it is completely grounded through Terminal 2. But when it is in reverse, neutral, and overdrive, if you look at it, Carefully, it's grounded through a 270 ohm resistor, quite a unique sensor. Now, checks can be made at either the C167 connector plugging into the sensor itself or at the C175 connector plugging into the PCM. This is really the best place to check it if the PCM is accessible to be certain as possible that these various signals are reaching the PCM. Now, here is an example of how Ford presents their connectors. They specifically ID their connectors from the harness view rather than the component connector as, as represented by the word female. Now, usually, the terminal ID numbers are also embossed somewhere on the connector 
assisting in locating a specific circuit to inspect or test. Now, here is a meter attached to terminal 3 at the PCM so as to inspect the signal for the TR1 circuit. This circuit is to be grounded and park reversed and neutral and OD2 and 1 we should see near battery voltage. This is a closer look of the wiring as it compares to the meter. As in park reverse and neutral, we have almost zero volts when the circuit is totally grounded. When the selector lever is moved to OD2 and 1, there is no longer a path to ground, uh, and, and 9.67 volts are seen. So again, we're comparing the schematic with the actual device and the testing of it, which is what reading wiring schematics is all about. Now here, we moved over to terminal 49 to check the TR2 circuit. Again, we see near zero volts reading when the circuit is grounded in park reverse in two, and 9.5 volts when the circuit is open in neutral OD in one. Now we're going to move the, the, the meter over to, to um, terminal 64, where we can check the TR3A circuit. This is the circuit that when it is not being fully pulled to ground, it's going through that 270 ohm resistor. Now here we can see <coughs> that when it is being fully pulled to ground in park two and one near zero volts is seen as it is bypassing the resistor. But when the selector lever is in reverse neutral and overdrive, we see that 1.667 volts. Now this is the five volt wire that is coming from the computer. So this five volt, when it passes through this 270 ohm resistor to ground, a voltage drop occurs, but it doesn't go to complete zero. That's why you see that 1.667 reading. Now you may recall uh, having seen this, both the open and closed status of this circuit in a scan tool. Here it is. I'm sorry, I was one slide behind you. Um, here you may recall seeing both the open and closed status of this circuit in a scan tool along with seeing this 1.66 volt reading when the circuit is open, meaning that it's not fully grounded. Again, the purpose of this presentation is about reading schematics to be able to test circuits. It's really not about teaching electronics, but uh, just a quick side note about electronics here is that this particular signal is referred to as a positive parity bit, which basically is a simple form of an error detecting code. Now, many um, later Model Fords use the same sensor, so the wiring will look identical. The only difference is the style of the computer, so you will need to identify the correct connector to be able to conduct the same type of checks. Now, Ford also uses a totally different uh, type of uh, a sensor. Um, like the one seen here on the 5R110W, Ford calls this a transmission range or park sensor assembly. Now when you look at an OEM wiring diagram, it shows that it has three wires going to the sensor along with a lengthy description of the assembly. It says that this is a non-adjustable sensor which contains circuitry to provide the PCM with a fixed frequency at a duty cycle for each of the various positions of the manual lever. Now at the end of two of the wires going to the sensor, it says to look at number schematic number 29-1 to know what their functions are. And when you locate this schematic, you can see that the wire that I have in the red box is a 12 volt supply wire from the PCM to the assembly, as well as to three Hall effect speed sensors. The wire I have in the blue box is the ground circuit from the PCM for all these components as well. So now we have, now when we come back to this wiring diagram for the sensor, we can see that the power wire is supplied to the assembly through terminal 21, the ground path to the PCM through terminal 17. This now identifies terminal 15 from the case connector going to terminal 25 as the PCM as the signal wire. Now, if you remember, this sensor provides the PCM with a fixed frequency at a duty cycle for each of the various positions of the manual lever. To know what should be seen when checking this sensor is another task. And where do you locate this information? It's just one of these steps in reading wiring diagrams. And one way is to find Ford's diagnostic material um, where for this particular sensor, which I have done using code P0706, 
And in their step-by-step -step diagnostic for this code, a chart is given that provides the minimum and maximum duty percentage, cycle percentage, that you're supposed to see for each range. And, and, uh, and this is not meant to be a commercial, honestly. I would just like for a moment to just point out that ATSG does include this kind of diagnostic information with their manuals to assist in making the information a, a little bit quicker to find and a bit handier. But with now having the terminals identified, along with a duty cycle chart, the percentage can be easily observed with a meter. A much simpler design and still widely used today in various configurations is the use of an inhibitor switch, which, which also is referred to as a mode or a range switch. And this is an excellent example of what this evening is all about. What you're looking at is how Kia provides information in checking their inhibitor switch in a 2009 Spectra using an A84CF2 transmission. Now notice how they include the TCM location, the switch location, both connector views with terminals highlighted alongside the electrical wire diagram. This is how all manufacturers should lay out the information. Now they do have a continuity check chart like this. This is, uh, this is the switch's check chart, which many of you may be familiar with, as it, uh, that is used to make continuity checks of the switch on the bench. There should be continuity between terminals 1 and 8 when the switch is in drive. If not, the switch is bad. Or if there is continuity between any other combinations while in drive, the switch is bad. But what this type of chart can help you see is which terminal is the power supply with not even looking at a wiring diagram. Terminal 8 is the power in, and when the selector lever is in drive, the power should exit the switch out of Terminal 1. Now, this is how the switch is represented in the wiring schematic, and you can see that Terminal 8 is the power in as the continuity check chart revealed. The check is easy, whether at the switch or at the computer, the signal voltage should be seen on one wire and one wire only, per range. Now, this is an example of a switch that's a bit more involved. This is what a continuity chart will look like for this type of switch. Notice that pin 5 or D is the power supply to the switch. When in the D3, it should exit the switch through four other terminals. So let's look at this in a wiring diagram. This looks similar to Ford's digital range sensor. The difference here is that there is one power supply to the switch. The switch then sends the power to the computer in various sequences. Ford sensor provided power on several circuits, which then were individually grounded. Now, if you remember from the continuity check chart, there should be four circuits supplying power back to the computer uh, when the selector lever is in the number three position. And this schematic confirms that all four circuits do. Now, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to bypass this last sensor and um, I'm going to try to pick this up with um, the speed sense or uh, solenoids. There are three basic uh, wiring configurations, along with two basic type solenoids, electrically speaking, to become acquainted with. There are two different styles that, that I'm talking about are either on, off, or PWN type. The first type of wiring that you will encounter is the one the solenoid has its very own power and ground circuits. The computer can control the solenoid from either the high side or the low side. The second type being where several solenoids share the same power supply and computer controls the solenoid on the ground or low side. Now the third type is where several solenoids share the same ground circuit and the computer controls the solenoids by supplying voltage to them, meaning the high side. Now, based on the type of solenoid, whether it's on or off or PWM, and the type of wiring, proper testing can then be determined. Here is a check on a two-wire on-off solenoid being controlled on the low side. When the solenoid is off, voltage is seen on the ground side of the coil inside the solenoid. But when the computer commands the solenoid on, a voltage drop occurs where basically zero volts is, is observed. Now looking now at a two-wire PWM solenoid being controlled on the high side like a GM pressure control solenoid, the on-off time can best be seen on a scope. It also can be observed in a duty cycle percentage or negative duty cycle percentage. It all depends on how you look 
hook up your leads to the solenoid or how you set up the meter. Here is an example of an on time of 23.29%. All I do is switch the leads and now you're looking at the off time. Another way is to amp clamp the wire and watch amperage on the circuit. Amperage increases as duty cycle increases and both can be observed and compared with a scan tool. Now I put here on the left side solenoids that share the same ground and on the right side solenoids that share the same power. In both instances, solenoid B is being checked. In both these checks, the solenoid is off. And obviously the readings are different. The one needing power is turned, uh, to turn it on has no power, while the one that needs to be grounded is not. And now all we're going to do is turn them on and we can see that the readings reverse because the systems are working in reverse. But by placing these wiring diagrams side by side, it helps to see the differences in the operation of the solenoids and the type of testings that can be done. And in conclusion, in the short amount of time that we've had together, there should be hopefully less hesitation figuring out how to test a rain switch, solenoids, and speed sensors. And by looking at this full complete wiring diagram, if most of you can determine what type of speed sensor is being used, the different types of solenoid setups that are involved, and the type of range sensors being used, and how to test them, then we've come pretty close at accomplishing our task for this evening. And I want to thank you for your precious time. Well, Wayne, that sure was a lot of information. Thanks so much for, for putting forth all the work to pull all that together. Uh, real quick, thanks again to our sponsors, TransStar and TransTech. Uh, we do have a few minutes left uh, to handle a few questions. I've got to take my hat off to Shannon and, uh, and the folks behind the scenes there for taking care of many of the questions during the course of the presentation. But there was a point here, Wayne, that I want to bring up with you to, to clarify. Uh, you pointed out a few things like the twisted wiring and how it shows up on the schematic. Uh, I know a lot of the guys uh, who are watching tonight are, are used to the, the engine side of things more than the tranny side of things, but a lot of this crosses that line, doesn't it? I mean, it, you have a, a, the twisted pair, a lot of times part of the bus network, uh, providing communications between various modules on the car. Very critical that those, those wiring twists be within specification, and that if you have to repair the wiring, it be repaired properly, because if you add any kind of resistance to that at all, then you're gonna screw up, but you have all kinds of loss of communication codes, won't you? Absolutely, yes. That's why it was interesting to see that GM offered up very specific details regarding the twisting of their speed sensor wires. All right, cool. And uh, also, we, we mentioned RF. Uh, for those of the folks who are, are fairly young and fairly new out in the audience, RF, radio frequency interference, uh, even electro, uh, electromotive interference, the underhood environment is a very noisy place, but with the uh, injectors going off and spark plugs going off, uh, and a lot of that will interfere with sensor signals if that shielding is not maintained. Okay, yeah, we'll that's right. Questions there. Do a few questions there for you, Wayne. Let's see uh, what we can go to here first. Um, got one here from uh, Bella at uh, Jan's. Uh, Jice transmission, if you can describe the function of, uh, he's calling the dropping resistor on the, the Nissan RE4 R018 transmission. Are you familiar with that? Oh, the, the, okay, the dropping resistor that's used to, um, that's tied in with the pressure control system is what I believe he's referring to. And, uh, and, and yes, indeed, um, there, the, there's a dropping resistor that's tied into the circuit uh, because once again we're controlling a pressure control solenoid, a uh, pressure control solenoid that's typically PWM or pulse width modulated um, is very low in resistance and, um, and so they're running a power supply through a dropping resistor so that that solenoid is not receiving a, a full amount of voltage and it's being controlled um, pulse width modulated. Uh, but but the dropping resistor will reduce the voltage supply to that solenoid. Sure, and then that's exactly what happens inside of any control modules that use a 5-volt or 8-volt reference, whatever the case might be. You know, that voltage is dropped from the original source back at the battery. That, uh, right, so, exactly. Yeah. 
Here's a great question. I know this. I've seen this quite a bit here. Uh, uh, the question is first to Honda's use of a linear solenoid, but I know there are other applications that use the same uh, device. Can you tell us what what is meant by a linear solenoid? Well, uh, linear linear solenoid, PWM solenoid. Um, I mean, they they the 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 idea is to control pressure in, in a linear way, but it's just a, another name for for a solenoid. I mean, it, it's still being controlled basically the same as any PWM solenoid, but they just call it linear in the sense of of how they're actually controlling the pressure, where they could actually ramp pressure up and ramp it down. So it's just like a fuel injector, huh? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so I mean, the longer, the more pulse width, the longer it's open, the more that pressurized fluid in the training can get to where it needs to get to. But if you're quickly exactly. turning it on and off, on and off, on and off, that's going to effectively lower the pressure. Uh, so, yeah, it's like a dropping resistor or a, a fuel injector that's running on longer pulse width. Well, I see we're just about out of time. Again, uh, thanks so much to, to you, Wayne, for uh, hanging out this evening and uh, sharing all this information. Thanks to everyone who came and participated. A great, great crowd tonight. Uh, of course, this is not the only webcast that we offer during the course of the year. Uh, make sure that you sign up for the Powertrain Pro newsletter or the Certified Technician newsletter or uh, the Motor Age newsletter to make sure that you know when the next webinar or what next training opportunity will come your way. Uh, once again, thanks to TransTech and TransStar for their support and helping us bring this free training opportunity to you. And uh, for myself, for Wayne Colonna, and for Shannon Brandenberry and the whole team at Motor Age and Powertrain Pro and ATSG, thanks so much and have a great evening.